Good evening. Welcome to this wonderful October rainy, gray, uh, nice evening. For those of us in California, we're very happy about the rain. And we're going to be getting at least a few more days of it. So that in itself is worth celebrating. Uh, tonight, this is Poetry Square, brought to you by Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture. And I am Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture Poet in Residence for the year. And I have two ladies with me tonight. Uh, Mr. Dig Wayne could not make it tonight, and he sends his apologies but we do have uh, Katie Brown and we have Laura Rosenthal. So we'll each be doing a few more minutes of poetry for you to, to fill in for the absent third person. But uh, um, tonight we have the full moon. We have, I think it's 10 days before Halloween. We have fall with the leaves and the rain, and it just kind of sets the mood for all things that are kind of, you know, between here and between there, let's call it that. So um, I'm going to open up with a poem that's called Autumn Rites, and uh, talks a little bit about, I tried to get some seasonal poems in for uh, this time of year, which I love this time of year. Autumn writes, Halloween brings back spirits of the past, a yearly autumn rite of passage where ghosts lead me back to walk through the streets of my childhood. I willingly go back, streets as familiar as my skin. It was upstate New York on crisp October days. Smells changed along with the leaf colors. The old oil furnace went from summer sleep, wakened. Its octopus arms abducting reached into rooms where no one slept, where rest did not easily come to those who sat up in the night waiting for a sign of life from spirits who still dwelled in the century-old homes. The big kitchen oven came alive again after summer heat and humidity, shut its doors for the season. In autumn, its wide mouth opened to bake hearty meals and cookie treats for kids to devour wholeheartedly. The compost grew rich over the season's worth of kitchen scraps that decayed and rotted into new soil. We turned it over with rusted pitchfork and breathed the fresh smell as open gardens or perhaps graves. Almost awaiting the presence, the feeling of long tendrils reaching for nearby necks. Crunching through fallen leaves, the weather was damp, the sky heavy with clouds. Maple leaves rained down and shiny horse chestnuts cracked, screen spiky shells for kids to collect. Autumn, season of Halloween, season of heavy scents and colorful leaves. Come, walk with me down foggy streets. And this little creature is my new puppy, Zora. Um, she's 12 weeks old. She's making her Zoom bombing appearance. And uh, just so everyone sees, this is a little Zora. This next poem is called Nostalgic Immunity. Memories, clearer than reality, less obscure than dreams, pressing one's face against the glass of a window that hasn't opened in years, perhaps even a home that no longer stands. Driving down streets, empty lots, boarded houses, taking a chance to be there in a neighborhood gone war zone, 
shootings and shoot ups with no sign of the life before when I grew up there. I find myself wandering amongst traditions, false fantasies long dead, when holidays held hope, summer vacation was long, and the porch glider lolled back and forth with nostalgic immunity. I can't really go home again. Those who were are no more. Those who tucked me in are buried beneath greasy ground and the grass and the marble that names them. I find solace that memories lull me to sleep at night and keep me company during the daylight. Thank you. I might have to have somebody rescue her from me because she's a little too involved. Um, this poem is called Midnight. Midnight, witching hour. The moon casts an opium haze along the paths of gravel toward the river. I've been told never to enter those trails after dark for they lead to intoxicating potions, exploration of arcane language and fornication under hidden constellations. I part the veil of tree limbs. Looking up, I see two large crows, possibly vampires, perched atop coastal redwoods. Well hung on their branches, they turn their gaze to me, squawk and squint. Animated twig arms undo my dressing gown, an elixir pressed into my palm, my robe falls revealing naked skin as smoky essence surrounds me. I'm dancing, whirling in semicircles beneath the night under the spell of what spirit? The crows appear before me, lying in a mound of leaves. Their feathers are now velvet cloaks, softly brushing over my body. A kiss then, rough against my neck, another sharp at my nape. The folds of black velvet envelop me as darkness descends. Come morning, I awaken, gather my gown around me. I am alone in the clearing by the river. Black feathers between my fingers, in my creases of nakedness, a curious thing. I don't remember. I don't remember the night. Blood on my collarbone, dripping like candle wax. I run, reach the trailhead. Without looking back, I hear them. Crows, raucous call from beyond. Mine, mine, mine. Kind of a spooky night poem. And uh, this one is called Lost Religion. It was under moonlight I lost my religion, sitting in the wind that today rings the old bell like a dainty wind chime, a clear message, go away, go away. To and fro the bell tolls, and I listen, and I write, and I read this morning. My religion was dead early in the morning before sunlight, therefore in moonlight. My friend wrote to me of her winding tale, her newfound belief in nothing higher than her own humanity, a great procession of no longer held beliefs. The unwrapped her worries for me and I entwined them with my own. We both cried silently then, 300 miles apart under the same fickle moon. And uh, when I lived in Tehachapi, there was a, uh, the city council 
was voting on having a labyrinth in a public park, uh, one of the public city parks, beautiful park. And the labyrinth would have been fully paid for by outside monies and wouldn't have cost the city a thing and would have been another sort of destination in the city to go to. And the city council voted against it because they thought it was of the occult. And of course, there are labyrinths in Europe, labyrinths in other cities. Uh, Catholic churches have labyrinths, but that was their final say. So this is called Labyrinth Lost. Walking the labyrinths in France, on Maui, in Mojave sand, in Bakersfield, for Christ's sake, setting intention, tracing the spiral, moving forward towards center, completion of journey and of watch, ancient cycle, deliberate steps, the old ways of many footsteps, beginning and end, call and response. The answer came in heated city council meetings of small-minded rural town. They voted no on a city park labyrinth. It's part of the occult, they screamed. The stone saints above the cathedral labyrinths whirled over shook marble heads in disbelief. And uh, this is called Flammable. And this was recently picked up by uh, San Diego Poetry Annual out of San Diego. Smoke signals from miles away, strong scent of campfires everywhere, Hazy, overcast, heavy air, unhealthy to breathe. Pine trees, flammable Roman candles lit by something, someone, deliberate, accidental, an act of miscalculated stupidity mixed with drought and wind. And conifers alight leap from one to another, a mishappening of fire atop a foothill's birthday cake, and the old sayings, we all fall down, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Dare they build again in the enchanted forest, lured by the dream of living wild, an authentic life in the woods, nature out the back door. But remember, fire makes nature stronger, cracks open pine cones that wouldn't germinate without that lick of flame awakening them. Animals scatter to lower ground, reassess instinct into strategy, unlike humans who rebuild over and over. And this poem is called Average Joe. And we all know an average Joe, don't we? And maybe we are average Joe. Dig down deep beyond the superficial, past the polite, keep going. Throw out any excuses, you call them reasons, but we all know they're not. You tell yourself you're doing your best, just an average Joe going through the motions bothering no one, but you don't sleep at night, do you? And you can't pull away from the fast food line or all the empties in the corner. They won't help you forget. It might seem like it's too hard to look in the mirror and place the blame. Do it anyway. Take that first step. Tell yourself you're trying. Talk a good, dazzling dame. It'll be different this time. I feel you. Give yourself a hug. Not too hard. You'll secrete the juice of all those convenient lies. And uh, talking about the, the moon and uh, one of my places that I really love visiting is uh, Maui in Hawaii. And 
This is called Maui Revisited. Somewhere between drops, splatters of night rain, the hisses of cockroaches in alternating corners, the full moon peaked in a slanted window, and I remembered Maui is a woman too, an island who leaves herself open Warrior kings, beneficent kings, sugar kings, all have trampled her soil. Maui will outlive all her masters. Her flowers will diversify. Jungles grow thicker with neglect. Somewhere between gecko chirps and steady morning rainfall, daylight brings his gold possibilities again. I need to remember the full moon in the slanted window, her secret as she whispered it, for the moon has always been female, awake in the night and questioning. And I will leave you with this last one. And it's called Vampire, or How I Became a Poet. A vampire of the sun, I sought and sucked every dappled drop of sunlit space, gorging myself on light, peculiar bat in flight by day, eschewing dim cave companions. I moved stealthily to sidestep shadows, draping my velvet cloak over bones cold as ash when distanced from sun's luminary libido. Wearily, I searched on overcast days, clouded quest forcing me to turn inward, fanning ember with my velvet wings, giving warm-blooded life to long-lost memories still pulsing still painful, warmth not easy as embracing the sunlight and stealing the heat needed to survive. My wings evolve to fingers, holding firm the pen, dribbling words to paper, poems in vampire's blood, not circulating naturally, but sucked from sources surrounding me. And thank you very much. Uh, we'll now hear from the poet, Katie Brown. Thank you, Diane. And thank you for the opportunity to read tonight. Um, and a oh, heartfelt thanks to Shante for the technical support that made it possible for me to get on this evening. Thank you so much. And I wanna thank everybody out there who's watching this and giving your evening to poetry tonight. Uh, we really appreciate your support. I'm a retired social worker and a garden variety poet. I've done many different kinds of writing, automobile humor, greeting cards, um, inspirational pieces, a multiple ending book for kids with Scholastic Press that was um, the cover for my weekly reader in October, the year that it came out. And I did a series of short children's mysteries for Meadowbrook Press. My photos and poems have appeared in Medusa's Kitchen and Convergence. My poetry has appeared in Persimmon Tree, Quill and Parchment, Brevities, and The Song of San Joaquin, to name just a few. I've been in several volumes of three anthology series, Sacramento Voices, Gathering, that's the anthology of the Ina Culpris Society, and poeming pigeons. I've had the po I've had my poems in California Fire and Water, the anthology that was released this last year, Fog and Wood Smoke, and my poems and photographs have appeared in Entering, an anthology of Davis poets. I've had three nominations for the Pushcart Prize, and my secret power is that I can catch a lizard with a blade of grass. I like to begin readings with one of my favorite poems by Terry Tempest Williams, When Women Were Birds. 
Once upon a time, when women were birds, there was this simple understanding that to sing at dawn and to sing at dusk was to heal the world through joy. The birds still remember what we've forgotten, that the world is meant to be celebrated. Like Diane, um, my favorite season is fall, my favorite month is October. And uh, it has always been so until I was about 40 years old when I started feeling kind of morose around October. And uh, it wasn't until I did some family tree research that I realized that all of my primary family members through the years had died in October, my mother, my father, my brother. So this is kind of an invocation. Beware, beware. The fires of October burn low in the field, and the smoky-eyed moon peers red above the hills. Like moths to the lantern, the souls of my family have all soared to death in the flames of October. By the light of three candles in quiet night hours, I hear the faint thumping of wings on the pane. On All Hallows' Eve, the spirits drift earthward. I listen for whispers of those gone before. Always among us. They are among us, sitting across from us in a waiting room, buying sorbet in the market, driving through the toll booth behind us. They look like us, almost, except they are quieter, more patient. They have a faraway expression in their exotic eyes. My grandmother was one. It was as though she held all of infin infinity in the bowl of her th thimble. None of my aunties or cousins recognized her for who she really was. My mother never knew, but my grandmother passed her secret on to me. I saw her one evening when I was a child. She was sitting in her chair. She simply smiled and rose into the air, chair and all. She held out her hand and I rose too. In these oblique hours, I count the moments curling away like wood shavings or peeled apple skins, the days turning in on themselves. Mondays twist into February, noontime swelters into August, and before I collect the, me the memories, Wednesday has melted into September, and my work is still undone. Notebooks and poems still unfinished. Somewhere on the far side of the globe, the sun is setting. Even now, that line of dusk races toward me across the Atlantic. I take up my pen and try to capture dawn as it whispers in shades of violet just beyond the Sierra. But the moment slips by. I try to describe seven white cranes rising from the bypass like incense or prayers. The day advances on me, surely as I hear October breathing, all the departed waiting for me at midnight. Chamomile for the Mollicans. The spider checks her web for moths that might have strayed in dim starlight into the sticky death. She lives in the corner above my doorway, a reminder for me of the cycle of all things. I watch her patch a ragged hole, then take my shears and make my way into the fields beyond the last porch light. Here, the wild and tame have grown together. Here, the owl patrols on silent wings. I've been harvesting sorrow this month, a task best done by the dark of the moon. Angelica for protection and myrrh for mourning. Rosemary to remember. Snowdrops for, the, for consolation. And chamomile for the mollicans. Which plant 
which root or stem or flower will give my heart song again? Which is the herb for breath, for moving on? What wreath or tea or infusion will bring about redemption, will make up for unsaid things, will bring back the moments lost forever? The light is coming up again, pearl behind the eastern mountains. It is time to give way to dawn, to return home. Enough of gathering sorrow for one night. Poets like forms, generally. I don't. I, I like to twist forms. And uh, some years ago, Carol Frith uh, introduced me to the unrhymed villanelle. So this is the first of several in this reading. Black Swan. You told me that swans mate for life. They form a bond that can't be broken. Today, I looked for water birds to photograph. You and I spent a quarter century together, delighting in the time we shared. Only a few species mate for life, you said. Your death has left me rootless, a landscape without color. I wanted to photograph something alive today. A little lake not far from here has birds, geese and ducks, coots and teal, and swans, four black swans, two pair. I thought of you today while I circled the lake, and one black swan followed me where I went. I photographed that swan, remembering you. You did not believe in omens, in metaphysics, but a black swan followed me all day while I took pictures of birds around the lake. Swans mate for life. Into the Blue. This one has an epigraph, and it's kind of a long poem. Even the most broken life can be restored to its moments. From the Blue Hour by Carolyn Forche. A blue heron rises from shattered reflection into the indigo hours before matins, scattering runes for redemption over water so profound no sunlight can pierce the gloom. Dark as stewed woad or mollusk shells, lapis ground into ultramarine like scattered sapphires or turquoise beads. You might think all hope is lost, but wait. The great blue shark that the Maori named Mako carves the fractured runes along a reef. Meaning is never lost. The most broken life measures in moments. Lamentation in flattened thirds and sevenths, the blue whale takes up an undulating song, calling into the diminishing future, sending longing into every note like a prayer hummed into the void. We dive. All of us, our prospects vague as a trail of bubbles along the deep song from beyond the range of light or contact. We are all plunging into the blue, diving through air or water or visions in the lexicon of yearning. Through the first azure shade before dawn, a light just below the surface, everyone, broken as a trail of bubbles rising from the deep. How we cultivate the pieces is a measure of our forgiveness. Into the gathering dark, spiraling toward the depths through a fan of ascending air, we follow the low rumble of Leviathan. We are all broken, and only the intense pressure at the edge of life will seal us back together. Something vast is calling. This last year, an anthology of climate crisis um, and change was done. Um, 
California Fire and Water. This was one of the poems that was in that anthology. Remembering Water. Remember the world of water, emerald ponds, aqua seas, turquoise bays, opal falls. Remember the meadows, alive with garter snakes and salamanders, and the rain, gentle showers, steely downpours, virga that never reaches the ground. Remember the world alive with the sounds of water in motion. We will tell our grandchildren about this world under desert nights, under an arid moon. This poem is for the pho photographers in the room. Brandishing light. Through the viewfinder of my camera, I understand the vocabulary of light. Colors my adverbs, shadows my nouns. This is the structure I prefer. Not words that redefine awareness, but a wraith of shadow, an exaltation of brilliance. Words confuse the mind, require selection and ordering. They must march to grammar's rules, Webster's spelling. Poets deal in twice translated reality. They rummage for the right word, steering the reader to uncover meaning. Poetry is too hard. I prefer the relative silence of a camera the quick detonation of an instant, that sudden arc that ignites one awareness with another. I yearn to speak in wavelengths of color, compose angles and planes and curves, fall into vortices of darkness. I want to brandish light. Rounded Edges I'm on the shabby side of 70. Aging has rounded my edges, slowed my step, edited my youth with glasses and sensible shoes. I'm loyal as an old hound, comfortable as a well-worn pair of slippers. I don't expect much and want less. My well-trained manners and passably pleasant voice, gone replaced with the curiosity and raucous laugh of a scruffy raven. I've lost track of friends, lost my keys, my phone, my purse. I no longer pamper my garden. I leave spiders unmolested in the corners. I have not aged gracefully. Never planned for this. Never thought I was getting old, aging. Through the years, I've kept clothes I'll never wear again and books I'll never read again. But my dancing shoes still fit. Living like a poet. I've courted my muse with chocolate, with gift cards and electric toys, outing, outings in the park. My muse has a mind of his own. He keeps his own hours, wears dark glasses and yawns when the sun is up, ready to rock when the clock in the dark corner reads 3 a.m. I try to set appointments with him, but he loses his calendar, forgets what day it is, what time it is. He goes on long weekends. Then when he comes back, he has a list for me of uninspiring tasks. Research five forms and use fear as a theme to write your poems. Revise six old sonnets. He says that I'm on my own if I try to work without him. I'm frankly tired of this relationship. I've started to see a younger muse. One more suited to my hours and desires. I'm ready to go steady again. Poets are a little like cats. If you don't pamper us, we'll stray. I'm looking out the window, waiting. And my final poem is 
apropos to this drought season, poetry in the time of drought. It's been a bad year to grow sonnets. Even the hothouse stanzas can't force rhyme, and villanelles languish all watery and pale. Tercets won't bloom into haiku, quatrains cream in uneven rows, sonnets lack form and inspiration. Couplets deny heroism. Limericks aren't funny. Leggy villanelles stagger around themeless. Even free verse seems incarcerated. All varieties suffer in this garden of verse. It's been an especially hard year for sonnets. We've sprayed for cliches, pruned the commas, carefully dug out adverbs, but even unrhymed villanelles lack taste. Poets rhapsodize about the weather, ignoring how quickly it can change. It's been a horrid year for sonnets, and villanelles grow spiteful and deranged. Now I'd like to turn this over to Lauren Rosenthal. We've saved the best for last. Have a good evening. Thank you for being here. I am so happy to be here. So first of all, thank you, Diane and Katie, for your lovely readings. Katie, I'm starting to see a younger muse, Diane, Vampire of the Sun. Yeah. And thanking Shantae Arroyo for being our tech wizard. Diane, thank you so much for reaching out to me and inviting me to be part of this reading. And um, we can't type into the chat, but I so appreciate everyone who's come to hear us, both people I know well, people I don't know, so just to mention people I do, whose presence I particularly appreciate, Tony, Mikey, Renee, Arlene, Stephen, Sue, Frank, and equally friends that I know but uh, don't see in the chat and, and people I've never met. You're, you're all equally a support for what we're doing here. And uh, Diane asked us to say a little bit about our writing stories. I started to write as a young adult in college. I felt a visceral need to create and respond to life with words and word play. That's just how I'm wired. And whatever it means to call oneself a writer, I did as a young adult. And then I took an odd unmarked turn in the road and found myself in law school and another odd unmarked turn in the road and found myself practicing law for about 38 years. Um, I was lucky, it was good creative work. I was able to use law to work toward better access to healthcare for folks who didn't have access. And during that time, unbeknownst to me, I became a better poet. So it's all good, but I am glad to be home. And uh, one of the high points in my life um, is that I will be starting an MFA program in creative writing as a student, of course, at Pacific University this coming winter. As to what matters to me as a writer, of course I care about the words, the music, the sensory sensual experience of sound, the ability to use imagery to engage with themes and experiences that matter to me without having to be painstakingly literal. But as I reflect on where I am right now as a writer, the biggest challenge for me is the gradual process of learning to tell the truth, whatever that means in a given poem, and learning to bring as much of myself as possible to the writing in hopes that it might open up possibilities for a reader or a listener. So let's do some poetry. And a friend asked me whether my, um, my poetry is uplifting. I am leaving that to you folks, but I do tend to like to start and end a reading with more overtly redemptive poems and leave the kind of tougher tangles for the middle. It's not a paradox. 
It doesn't take a Zen master to hear the sunlit leaf's exhale, the grasshopper's leap, the supplication of the praying mantis. One hand claps, the tiny hairs on the back of your arm carry the message. The next one is a story poem. When the famous poet visited our campus, voice a throbbing drum, face a luxuriant prairie with its explosion of gray white tufts, when he declaimed across the lecture hall whose seats tiered upward from a sunken stage like the amphitheater where bare-chested gladiators flaunted curlicued feathers, golden armor, bronze spears, shin guards bedizened with bar relief, a girl with wire hanger limbs, Indian bedspread gathered into a skirt cascading with burgundy flowers, elephants, wheels within wheels, that girl raised her hand to say his notion of the feminine needed revision. Though he offered it up as a pin, it was just the same old shit. Woman muse, man creator. And what of us, she asked. And the poet shrugged. And she continued to argue a wire hanger poking against the rounded shoulders of a loopy oversized sweater. God damn, who wouldn't side with the sweater? And those of us who agreed, but were glad to be anyone other than her, looked away. And later, when my professor commented on the girl's lack of subtlety, a near miss, the triumph of brute logic over metaphor. My silence placed me on his side of the debate, though 50 years later, I take it all back, <coughs> slam my book shut, <coughs> sorry, slam my book shut, scattering words in all directions, sweep her into my chariot, exit spitting noxious green clouds. The next poem is about <coughs> intergenerational war trauma, how the trauma of one generation can be passed on to the next. The title and the epigraph sequentially come from a report entitled The Intergenerational Effects of War on the Health of Children. And the poem is written in the form of a pantoum, which has a pattern of repeating lines and phrases. A war may end, but its effects do not. The ravaged husband years from the front the wife's face stained with disillusion, two children, a girl and a boy. Do they know the air they breathe? A stain they can't apprehend. The war ended before they were born. Why then does their breath stop when fireworks fail to ignite? The war ended before they were born. It's not like their cells are on fire. Still, what fails to ignite sputters and smokes in the dark. It's not like their cells are on fire, the front years and miles away. Darkness sputters toward day. A girl, a boy, do they know the air they breathe? Since I considered myself a poet when I was a young adult, I'm going to read one poem that was in a small booklet that I put together self-published in 1977. I know some people listening here weren't born yet um, with a small writing group I was in. We called the booklet The Fine Line. The cover was a little doodle that I had done. 
And this tiny poem is called Bear the Cat Peed on My Poems. Fortunately, he didn't get any of my words, only the empty space around the words. I cut it away, still have empty space around the words. This next poem was in Dave Bowles' um, anthology, Quiet Rooms, a couple of years ago. You all know Dave, he's a Grass Valley um, treasure with Cold River Press. And this poem called In Response to Your Questions is an unrhyming sonnet that consists only of answers. You'll have to guess at the questions. In response to your questions, because you seem to assume decomposition more than wanton destruction, because not all languages distinguish between green and blue, because ambiguity is not the same as imprecision, because science, because it was translated by 19th century British men, because there's no essential self that can be reborn, because that would lead to solipsism, because I said so, the latter, the digits appear to be randomly distributed. Honestly, no. The first Tuesday after the first Monday to get to the other side. Why do you ask? I'm going to read a, a piece, a section from a much longer, not yet published poem. The poem, um, which is mostly in prose, is titled Hashtag Olympian Pussy Grab. And it tells the millennia old Me Too story in part through the stories of women depicted in ancient myths, as well as um, contemporary women, including those who testified in the Harvey Weinstein trial. The setup in the poem is essentially a support group in which each of these women um, are telling their stories, telling their truth. And I'm going to read you the section that is Persephone's story um, to give you just a very, very glancing refresher on Persephone. Her father was Zeus, the king of the gods. Her mother was Demeter, the goddess of the earth. And um, her uncle who abducted her was Hades, the god of the underworld. Her father Zeus um, had his own string of rapes behind him. So this is Persephone speaking to the group. My story isn't even mine anymore. Am I surprised you think you know it too? And don't think it's just the dead white men. Do you know how many feminist poets have claimed me as their own? What really hurts? That fantasy about daddies and daughters. He's over the moon from the moment he lays eyes on you naked and squalling. Come on. He'll always be your champion, suitors beware. Don't even think about the Freudian overtones. They're harmless. You want a champion, someone who'd lie down on the road for you, someone who'd let chariot wheels crush his spine sooner than he'd let danger tickle your arm. Well, danger tickled my arm and he, he did squat. You know who my father is, right? The king of the gods, the god of sky and thunder, the god who turned himself into a swan and the god who turned himself into a bull and the god of seduction, abduction. Danger tickled my arm. We were wild that day. 
staggering through the field, arms overflowing with flowers, wild striped, prismatic, pungent, blood lily, jacaranda, amaryllis, lavender, shooting star, rose, myrtle, a contest. Who could gather the most? Who could balance one more cluster atop her ungainly bundle? We collapsed in giggles as blooms fell to the ground, fragments rising with a wind, goaded one another on, hungry to prolong the delicious hours of play. I wandered off, intrigued by one magnificent flower that grew more beautiful, more enormous by the second, a narcissus. As I reached down to pluck it, no one else saw the ground break open. No one else saw a being more wind and ice than man sweep me into his chariot. No one else saw the chasm fill behind us with rocky black soil as fast as it had opened. My uncle, Hades, carried me off. Later, whispers that he wouldn't have dared without Zeus's consent. I won't listen to that. Still, only my mother's despair could get Zeus's attention and not till she was so wretched, earth herself starved. Zeus never came for me. He never asked what happened. Finally, finally, he sent Hermes. Hermes, a messenger boy. And good grief, that story they tell about the pomegranate, they can't even keep the facts straight. One version says Hades tricked me into eating half a pomegranate, another that he fed me six of the six of the vermilion seeds. I can't remember. Either way, I had no say in the grand compromise, the way they split the difference. Six months to roam above ground, always dreading my return. Six months, a nominal queen in my rapist's palace. They say my mother was party to the deal. But every year, as the underworld sucks me back into its darkness, she pulls her grief tight around her back, her shoulders, her full bosom, and the frigidity of the land above matches my own. This next shorter poem will be will be in Driftwood Press magazine in the January edition. And it's a little surrealist poem. Why do you say it's the life force? It's a dying rose. The frog lies cracked on the ceramic lawn. Miles of fingers drip from the willow. This is not some empty argument, if by nothing you mean eyelashes lost in the pandemic. The dogs sniff confused at the old oak's bark. Think of me as a vat of soup crying out for salt. If you phoned in the middle of the night, I'd think you were a crocus. You no longer need to wear a mask. I can't see your face amidst the heliotrope, the way the bees congregate on its surface, how to know if it's purple. A spectacle lies, a spectacle lens lies on the pavement, the one-eyed trailer squats on the grass, the motorcycle's front wheel stares out from its tarp. Every singed leaf reminds me of home, love, the fear in this body knows no borders. And I didn't say hi before to my cousin Alice, who surfaced in the chat um, after I started. Hi, Alice. We're down to the last two poems. This one appeared in Buddhist Poetry Review about a year ago. And it is in the form of a rondo, which is a kind of song. The poem is actually dense with Buddhist references, 
but since it's also a song, I'll just translate a couple. Avalokiteshvara is the bodhisattva of great compassion. And he's often depicted as having a thousand arms to reach out to those who are suffering. And Mara is the personification of our suffering or of how we lead ourselves or succumb to suffering. Cruising, cruising down Samsara Drive, someone tell me how to grieve, looking for Motel Nirvana where Avalokiteshvara extends his thousand arms. I crave his cool embrace, sweet palliative, but when did bodies not deceive? What is Eden? What Gamara? Still cruising samsara. Ask how many nights I've cried. Maybe you're dead, maybe alive. Wanted a Bodhi, got a Mara. Lose you, keep you, what's a lover? But a long, hot ride down an endless drive. Cruising samsara. And I promised redemption for the final poem. This poem was also in Dave Bowles anthology, Quiet Rooms. Cooking steel cut oats on New Year's Day, the epigraph from James Wright, and I see that it is impossible to die. Because it is impossible to die, everything else is possible. Every moment, a tightly curled leaf feeling into its dimensions, not so much craving infinity as inhabiting it. To take just this measure of time, which exists no more or less than death, to breathe the watery perfume of the oats, the simple scent of starch, enough to define a moment lived. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And thank you again, Diane and Yuba Sutter Arts. And there you have it. Um, another episode, another month of Poetry Square for October. And yes, we should have applause for the poets who read tonight. Uh, thank you, Katie Brown. And thank you, Laura Rosenthal, um, a wonderful evening of poetry. And again, a thank you to Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture. I'm Diane Funston, um, poet in residence for Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture. And next month for November, uh, we will be hearing from David Bauman, Cheryl Latif, and Julian Matthews. And until then, um, have a wonderful rest of the month. Stay spooky on Halloween, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. <laughs>